thank you very much for um, inviting me to give a presentation. I'm thrilled to talk about our latest results on repetition. So why are we interested in repetition and what do we know about repetition? The classical model is that repetition um, is a joint function between what is called Wernicke's area in the superior temporal gyrus and Broca's area in the um, posterior inferior frontal gyrus and they're connected by the arcuate fasciculus. That is the classical model of language as we've known it for a long time. And conduction aphasia that primarily symptoms is uh, repetition deficits is due to a disconnection between Broca's and Wernicke's area. So those patients can still um, articulate language and they have intact auditory comprehension but they can't repeat what they hear. So the transfer of information between the superior temporal gyrus and the posterior inferior frontal gyrus is interrupted. And that was the classical disconnection model that was described. Now, that model has been challenged. It has been challenged for two reasons primarily. The first being that we have what's called atypical patients. So patients that present with the symptoms of repetition deficits but they do not have a lesion to the arcuate fasciculus, so there is no apparent disconnection between the two regions. So that is the first conundrum. The second is that we can have patients that present with the behavioral symptoms, but their lesion um, is outside the arcuate fasciculus. Okay? So those two aspects challenge the classical disconnection model. Now with... Um, post-mortem imaging and um, CT imaging, the area that emerged to be um, related to repetition deficits was the inferior parietal lobe. So there was more and more evidence that pointed towards the inferior parietal lobe being important for repetition. And this was actually put forward first by Go Kurt Goldstein um, and was revisited in modern neurology by Norman Geschwind. So there was gathering evidence for the parietal lobe to be involved. However, so far there is no consensus of where the lesion needs to strike for repetition deficits to occur. And one of the reasons that could be the case is that all the data was primarily based on stroke patients. There is some limitations of the stroke model when we look at the behavioral correlates. So the first one is that um, a stroke is hardly ever only cortical or only subcortical. So what you see on the first um, line here is a schematic representation with Broca's area and Wernicke's area, and in the middle we have what is called now Geschwind's area, and those areas are interconnected by the arcuate fasciculus directly or through the inferior parietal lobe. Um, and when you have a stroke to the cortical region, what usually happens is that the white matter underneath it is affected as well. So based on a patient like this, when we look at the repetition deficit, it's hard to say if that deficit is caused by the white matter or if that deficit is caused by the cortical damage that we see. Now, if we take um, another patient, so now the lesion is um, still cortical and subcortical, but now outside the language area. Again, we have the same problem. We don't know what causes um, the presentation of um, repetition deficits. Now, with the last patient, we have a pure subcortical lesion, so only affecting the white matter. But in this case, we can't differentiate which part of the white matter is affected in this patient. And ultimately, every lesion to the white matter will lead to a cortical degeneration as well over time. So here we go. Um, this model is limited in terms of what we can learn from it. So we thought that maybe changing the model might help us understand where repetition deficits um, are linked to in the brain. Um, we started looking at primary progressive aphasia patients. So those patients, as you heard earlier today, have a, um, a neurodegenerative disorder that selectively affects the language in the beginning. And those patients, especially two subtypes, do present primarily with uh, repetition deficits as well. Now, why is this a good model? It's a good model because um, Marcel Mesolam and many others now have um, beautifully demonstrated that PPA does affect the cortex and leads to atrophy in cortical regions. Um, but also, 
In 2003, um, Marco Catani looked at the MRI spectroscopy within the voxels that contain um, streamlines of the arcuate fasciculus and could show that when comparing left and right um, measurements in PPA patients, the left seems to have um, reduced um, axonal density. So what this means in conclusion is that we can look at the gray matter and the white matter and are sensitive to deficits in both. So this is the model that we then used. Um, we looked at 30 patients and matched controls and collected diffusion um, data on them, but also T1 and cortical measures and compared both um, with the repetition. So what you see here is on the left, the tractography reconstruction in a single subject, a healthy control, where you can see the direct connection between Broca's and Wernicke's area indicated in red, that's the long segment, and then an indirect um, pathway that goes via the inferior parietal lobe, um, represented here in green by the anterior segment and in yellow by the posterior segment. Now on the right, what you can see is the cortical morphometry areas that we used for this analysis, and those areas are um, the cortical termination areas of the arcuate segments in the cortex, and also areas that have been implicated in the literature to um, cause repetition deficits when damaged. We first looked at the difference between the patients and the controls, and what we could see is that the long segment, so the direct connection between Broca's and Wernicke's area, was not significantly different in terms of its volume between controls and patients. However, when we looked at the indirect segment, we did see a significant difference between controls and patient, and as you can see, that difference seems to be driven by the posterior segment slightly more than the anterior segment. Now, when we looked at the cortical areas, we found that um, the posterior inferior frontal gyrus was significantly different between patients and controls, uh, not the precentral. When we moved to the inferior parietal lobe, the anterior supramarginal area was not different. The posterior supramarginal gyrus was significantly different, and the angular gyrus, again, was not different between um, patients and controls. And then all areas in the temporal lobe, including the sylvian parietal temporal area, which is in the little cutout here, um, they were all different between patients and controls. Now, how does that relate to repetition? So we first looked at the classical model, obviously, and correlated the direct connection between Broca's and Wernicke's with uh, measures of repetition. And what you can see here in the graph on the bottom left is that there seems to be no association between the volume of the tract in the left hemisphere and PPA patients and their performance on a repetition task. However, when we looked at the indirect segment, you can now see that that association became significant. When we looked at which component of the indirect connection was driving the correlation, we could see that it seems to be mainly the posterior segment driving the correlation. However, when you look at the plot, you can see they're not fundamentally different, um, except for the two green um, outliers for the anterior segment, so I'm assuming there's a mild difference between the two. Now, for the cortical areas, um, when we did the, the correlation and corrected for multiple comparisons, the only area that survived the correction was the posterior supramarginal gyrus, and if you remember the previous slide, that was also the only area that was different between patients and controls. So we could see a strong correlation between the volume of the posterior supramarginal gyrus and uh, performance on the repetition task. Now, coming back to um, the model and whether or not it's useful, when we look at the lesion in this case now, what we can see is that for um, the first patient that I'm showing you here, so those are again individual patients, not group maps, you can see that this patient actually has um, a cortical lesion to the posterior supramarginal gyrus, which we can detect. And at the same time, you can see on the tractography reconstruction on the left that the anterior and the posterior segment have both degenerated. However, the long segment is still perfectly intact in that patient. So we can now disentangle both of those um, atrophies. For the second patient, we can see that even though the posterior supramarginal gyrus does not seem to be affected in that patient, when you look at the tractography, the anterior segment is selectively degenerated um, in that patient. And then vice versa, the last patient, on the cortical um, analysis, we can't detect uh, a degeneration yet. 
But when you look at the reconstruction of the white matter, you can see that both the anterior segment slightly and the posterior segment slightly more pronounced have degenerated. Again, the long segment is still intact. So it seems like changing the model might actually help us understand repetition in the brain um, better than using the classical stroke model. And the conclusion from, from the study is that the direct segment, even though that seemed to be the classical assumption in our data and uh, the stroke data that I looked at previously, did not seem to correlate with repetition. However, the indirect segment did show um, correlations with repetition deficits in our PPA patients. So we need to shift our understanding slightly more lateral um, than medial, as it seems. For the cortical regions, um, SPT, we did not observe any correlation with um, repetition deficits. However, the area that came up um, consistently for us was the posterior supramarginal gyrus. Um, and there is different ex possible explanations why uh, the inferior parietal cortex might be important for repetition. Um, one is obviously that we need to transfer the information from the auditory areas to the articulation area, so it's an auditory motor mapping of words. Um, the other explanation is that it could be an indirect semantic route that goes through the uh, inferior parietal lobe. And then obviously, um, well-documented hypothesis is also that we need working memory to repeat. And the longer the sentences become for repetition, the more we rely on our working memory, obviously. Um, and that will include the inferior parietal cortex. So all in all, it's probably time to update our classical model of conduction aphasia. Um, and I hope I convinced you that this might be a good way forward. Now, I want to leave you with um, a little video and just a preamble. If anyone is a bit squeamish, just close your eyes in a minute. Um, for the rest of you, this is hopefully as exciting as it was for us. So the idea was how can we test this model further? How can we validate whether or not that actually might hold. So what you see here is a um, brain tumor patient who underwent awake surgery in London, um, performed at Queen Square, and they stimulated the cortical area that is exposed during the surgery and asked the patient to repeat. And they asked to repeat single words and they asked to repeat longer sentences. Now, what you will see in a minute is that the neurosurgeon stimulated the cortical areas, and depending on where the stimulation was applied, the patient was able to repeat or not repeat. And I just want you to pay attention to the anatomy, and that should get you just as excited as we got when we saw it. Right. So the area that consistently caused repetition deficits was the inferior parietal cortex in that patient. Now, obviously, that is a single subject, so we need more validation. Um, but as I said, I got really excited when I saw this. Thank you very much for your attention, and thanks to my collaborators.